in a world where men are trying to live as gods. One shinobi must learn what it means to be human. What does it mean to live, and not simply survive? Shinobi, open your eyes. What's the matter, Stray? Nothing left to lose. Will you join me, starving wolf? I must cut you down before you fall to Shura. Shura! They kill solely for the joy it brings them. You can't be Shura! A true wolf will choose for himself how to use his fangs. The look on your face tells me you've done just that. The Shinobi showing the likes of compassion. A fitting fang for a one-armed wolf. Sekiro follows the FromSoft trademark approach to storytelling. Give your players the pieces and see if they can put it together themselves to discover the overall picture. Some people hate it, some people love it, I'm one of the latter. If you tell someone a story, you pass the time. If someone has to tell themselves the story, they learn something about themselves. Regardless, Sekiro's various pieces have been scrutinized and dissected by a great many people, including a certain soft-spoken British man who I'm sure all of you know. But I've yet to hear what Sekiro is actually about. I mean, we know the events that took place, but what, what do they mean? What, what was the point? FromSoft gets accused of having games with no story quite often, so let's properly break it down. And yeah, yeah, the, the standard FromSoft stagnation bad because reasons narrative is part of that narrative picture, but it's not the main point, it's a symptom. To piece together that narrative picture, we need to look at the setting. And two very important characters, Wolf, of course, and Emma. And then we need to understand both Yin and Yang and how they relate to Japanese Buddhism. First, though, a brief setting recap to put all the events in the proper context. So there was a dragon, presumably from China, given the appearance, and this dragon became injured at some point when, no idea, could have been en route to Japan or just a vacation accident. Doesn't matter. What does matter is where it landed, became stuck, and upset the natural balance. That place is... Ashina. Now the people of Ashina have a roommate, but he's not a very good roommate. You know, the kind that would leave clothes and dirty dishes about, except it's a giant divine dragon, so it starts spilling immortality all over the place instead. Part of this immortality seems to seep into the water where it landed, and the streams and rivers carry that immortality-tainted water to all corners of Ashina, in varying degrees. The dragon's landing has caused a fundamental imbalance in the land, and an imbalance of yin and yang, causing two distinct immortalities to sprout. Yang variant and the dragon's heritage and the yin equivalent, the rejuvenating waters. To our mortal eyes, both of these must seem like great boons until they aren't. We'll talk about the specifics later. Afterwards, the powers that be for the rest of Japan recognize the great bounty of Ashina and decide, hey, that's ours now. The Ashinites dislike this, of course, but they aren't a very powerful people, so they get ousted. Then Japan continues to do Japan shit and has ungodly, horrible wars that eventually weaken the central forces that took Ashina, and seeing this, the Ashinites go full-on offensive to reclaim their land led by none other than Sword Saint Ishin himself. They win, and all is hunky-dory for about two decades, and then the game starts. So that's what happened before the game. That's our setting. But it is missing a crucial detail, our protagonist. A lone boy scavenging a battlefield full of corpses. There is no light in his eyes, no hope. His entire world around him has burned to ash, and he was powerless to do anything about it. There is no one home except the bodily instinct to survive this war-torn hell. The animal is the only thing that lives. A rogue shinobi comes across that boy, and unlike the rest of us who might take pity or offer aid, 
Owl channels his inner African warlord and thinks, Child soldier. Owl sees his broken will and thinks of him as the perfect tool. Owl raises him, names him Wolf, and teaches him the ways of the shinobi. He also drills two very central sentiments into Wolf's mind, one explicit and the other implicit. The former, the Iron Code, do what you're told, do not think. And the latter, survival is the only thing that matters. Morals, ethics, all of these things are just things that get in the way. These two core tenets are the entirety of Wolf's character at this point. This is the crux of our character narrative. See, Wolf or Sekido is a man devoid of will. He's a puppet, well and true. If he isn't being told explicitly what to do either by his master or his instincts, he will literally sit there like an object. Now, given that Wolf seems to be in his early to mid 20s, good God, he looks like he's in his 40s. What hard living does to a motherfucker. Anyway, this condition really isn't his fault. I mean, he, he's a child of war and raised by an actual psychopath. The lights inside have been effectively shut off like a protection mechanism, and then that trauma has been reinforced by this huge footed degenerate. I mean, look at those clod hoppers. It's a wonder he became a shinobi with those clown shoes. Then the game begins, and we, as the players, take over at a very crucial moment in Wolf's life. He has no real orders, and his contact has been cut with the more malevolent aspects of his support network. He has a vague idea of what to do, reunite with Kuro, but this is his first time interacting with the outside world without a more biased lens. Emma, Kuro, the sculptor, and others begin to chip away at the conditioning that war, strife, and owl have inflicted on him and he begins to see a bigger picture through each of them. The sculptor, his future. Kuro, his present. And Emma, his past. Through them also runs another narrative thread based around properly balancing yin and yang, both in yourself and in the greater world, but we aren't quite ready for that part yet. So after being disarmed by Genichido and then given a hand by the sculptor, Wolf sets off to recover Kuro. He interacts with the locals, kills a bull, and finally reunites with Genichido at the top of Ashina Castle. Genichido is an anthropomorphized representation of Ashina herself, and he shows us our first clues of what makes the rejuvenating waters different from the dragon's heritage. Lord Genichiro, is this the rejuvenating waters? His resurrection is not like ours. Not that ours is a good thing either, as we end up discovering, but it is indicative of his mindset. He and his body now are heavily resistant to change, overly charged with an imbalance of yin. He is willing to commit any horrid act in the name of survival, as if there's no other way, willing to destroy himself and his country in pursuit of saving what embers would remain. He's like a cornered animal, not unlike many of the people in this story. After defeating Genichiro, Wolf reunites with Kuro, who has a surprise for him. He wants to die. Now, his reasoning is that his immortality creates ambition in men around him, and they destroy themselves in pursuit of it, and he isn't wrong. But this dilemma short-circuits Wolf's brain. He must obey the Iron Code and protect and obey Kuro, but if he obeys Kuro, he must allow him to die as per his wishes. You're left with a choice, follow the code or follow Kuro. But it's not actually a choice, is it? You can try as much as you like. Wolf is literally incapable at this point of actually thinking for himself. That's why this false choice is even presented to you, to show how deep his conditioning actually runs. Kuro eventually somewhat persuades him, however, and he does set off to gather the ingredients to sever Kuro's immortality. First, we, of course, get the double murder blade for killing stuff deader than a normal murder blade. The mortal blade. If you had such a weapon, it may be the key to what you are after. In this process, though, you meet the divine child of the resurrecting waters with foe dragon heritage. This will be very important later. Then we set off to get ingredients for magic incense, because smelling like heaven is how we get into heaven. Look, I, I'm here to help you understand the narrative theme of this game, not make sense of Japanese mythology, just pretend it makes sense. 
Go off, kill a big monkey. Go down, kill a ghost monk. Go back to report, only to find Owl, your adoptive father waiting for you. Important to note at this point, you thought he was dead because he faked his death right in front of you, father and actor of the fucking year here, ladies and gentlemen. If he fooled an honest-to-goodness professional assassin with his dead body acting skills, give that fucker an Emmy. This, however, is the most important point of our story. It's the climax, not of the events of the story, but of Wolf's narrative arc. Two paths in the night diverge here. Owl presents Wolf with a choice, an actual, real choice. And the first real choice you've had the entire game, besides the moment-to-moment -moment choices of survival. Obey your father. Obey the Iron Code and forsake Kuro, or choose to defy it. Let me fix these options to say what they really say. To quote Andrew Ryan, a man chooses, a slave obeys, and a slave doesn't get to choose their master. If you renounce your will, this is what happens. Shura. Now, why does this actually happen? I mean, Wolf has been killing people nonstop for hours up until this point, but this, this is the turning point? Yes, because Wolf has completely given up at this point. Not physically, but spiritually. Now, most of us have some kind of inner drive to find a greater purpose. We like to believe that our actions contribute to a greater whole, and even if we can't see it, our sacrifices mean something. At the end of the day, we push through the unknown to hopefully grasp a single shred of the divine and hope that divine shred will elevate us from the talking apes that we are. And in a real way, it does. We circularly create meaning and purpose, even independent of organized religion. It is our reaching for the divine that makes us human. But there is another path. You could instead embrace the animal. Shura represents a fully realized version of what Owl accidentally taught him. Don't think for yourself, and survival is the only thing that matters. All of it means nothing except survival and feeling good, and killing feels good and preserves survival. He kills Owl because he finally realizes that his own foster father is a threat, and ethics and morals don't matter. Only the animal remains, none of the man, wrapped in an immortal shell, wielding two blades of pure death. The cycle repeats. In a way, this echoes a common thread amongst survivors of extreme trauma, survivalist thinking. You're thinking hour by hour, day by day. There is no grander purpose, nothing to strive for, only hope for the next dawn. In war-torn Japan, I have to imagine this was a pretty common occurrence for a great many people, but few of them possess the raw power and capability that Wolf has. Wolf, until this point, has never even enjoyed his own life. I mean, for fuck's sake, Kuro's rice balls are the first cooked meal he's eaten not solely for sustenance. It is sweet when you bite into it. Bite? Wolf, rice tastes a lot better when cooked. I'll make something nice for you. Something nice. <laughs> You'll have to wait and see. Which is why he's the perfect protagonist to represent this dilemma. I mean, he has survived his whole life, but not once has he ever lived. There was the next mission, the next kill, and the next order. Never once did he do a single thing for himself, unless you choose the second option, which is to choose to continue serving Kuro. A code must be determined by the individual. This is what I've decided. Just as my master did. Don't disregard the animal, but don't embrace it either. Learn to reach for something greater and embrace the sacrifice of oneself for a greater ideal and bear responsibility for one's life in spite of the extremely unfair circumstances of your birth. Now we have our first hidden theme, finally laid bare. Exploring what it means to live versus survive. What it means to be human by self-actualizing and learning to self-sacrifice or descend into animality by embracing baser emotions like anger and fear. The paths that lead us there and the consequences of those paths. The Shura ending is a dead end, truly. So, if we do choose to rise above and embrace the divine, what, what does that mean? 
to what ideal should we even aspire to? For that, we need to talk about the other theme that runs rampant through this game, yin and yang, and once you see them, you, you'll see them everywhere. But also Emma and the divine child of the rejuvenating waters. The concept of yin and yang have been somewhat abused by our Western sensibilities. Yang is the pushing force, the masculine energy responsible for heat, light, and change. Yin is the pulling force, the feminine energy responsible for cold, darkness, and resistance to change. It's a gross oversimplification, but it'll do. What's important to note is that neither of these energies are evil. It's the imbalance between them that is considered bad. Having too much yang is an uncontrolled blaze that burns everything in its path, while too much yin begets rot and stagnation. They must remain in balance. When the dragon landed in Ashina, it created an imbalance. This dragon appears to be a yang dragon, and the dragon's immortality works via absorbing the yang of its surroundings, much like how Kuro's and your immortality works through the dragon's heritage, which is where the dragon rot comes from. You absorb the yang of your conspirators or just the people around you. The natural life force that everyone has, that allows them to live their lives and function as human beings, has been taken from them. Their blood has stagnated. Can it be cured? Yes, by giving back what has been taken. Here you are. This, however, leads the dragon to absorb all the yang present at the fountainhead, leaving the water with only yin present in it, which is why the rejuvenating waters cause such horrible side effects to those who imbibe it, and why their resurrection is so different from the yang variant. They are robbed of their minds and their agency, as both require yang to function. But, as a consequence, they are now highly resistant to all forms of change, including physical damage and harm, Fire can restore that balance partly, which is why it's so effective on the red eyes. It's also not an accident that the sculptor keeps talking about flames, or that your tools primarily revolve around fire as an omnipresent element. It's also not an accident that fire harms those who have taken in the rejuvenating waters or the red eyes. Kuro and Wolf are the main drivers of the game's plot. They are the yang element. Kuro has the plan, Wolf has the capability, but this... This is where Emma and the Divine Child of the Rejuvenating Waters, who I'm just going to call the Divine Child or the Child from now on, enters the picture. They are Wolf and Kuro's mirror. They are the literal yin to their yang. They provide support and guidance to both of you that helps you properly harness your own energy in a true symbiosis. Emma's backstory is literally the same as Wolf's. Found on a battlefield after losing everything by another shinobi, the sculptor, who did take pity on her, or at least wasn't the shinobi equivalent of Satan. However, he didn't raise her. She was raised by his friend Dogen, the doctor and also the maker of your prosthetic. One thing's for sure. She's happier for the fact she wasn't raised by a shinobi. Emma supports you via a healing gourd, water to your fire, and of course, her advice and guidance. She is content with her lot in life and actively chooses to support those around her. She also shows you that you are not a bad person. You were raised to be a killer, and at the time, you had no choice in the matter. Owl took advantage of you. Had you not been unlucky, you could have ended up like her instead. The child and Kura were both born into immortality. They didn't ask for it, and both saw what the lust for immortality was doing to the people around them and actively choose to end it. He is born of the dragon, Yang, and she is born of the water, Yin. She ends up correctly guiding his efforts later on in the true ending. This is why, in the Shura ending, Emma is the first to die, and it's why the battle between the two of you is so important. Sakido doesn't reach full Shura status until his balancing equivalent is gone and dead. She is consumed by your flames, and now you are free to burn unimpeded. This is also why, by the way, if you do the dragon's return ending and the child becomes the cradle, she becomes all super cold and gives you fine snow instead of rice now. It's because she's become a perfect spiritual embodiment of yin by eating those serpent livers. Yin is the feminine energy, but it's also for cold, dark, etc., etc. 
When she says cradle, she literally means it. She has to be the perfect feminine to be able to withhold the dragon's essence, which is presumably pure young. Japanese Buddhist mythology is real, real weird, but it is fucking fascinating. So then, Providing Wolf makes the choice to continue serving Kuro. He gets to go to the Fountainhead, kills a non-ghost monk, interacts with the weird locals, see a big fish, and then finally gives that dragon at the beginning of our story something to really cry about. Wolf now has a choice of three endings. Severance, Purification, and the Dragon's Return. Two of these, I would argue, are traps. Severance is simply misguided. Kuro dies, and undoubtedly the dragon's heritage simply chooses somebody else as it did before, and Wolf is ultimately left purposeless again. Purification. Emma convinces Wolf to sacrifice himself to rid Kuro of immortality, but once again, very likely the dragon's heritage just chooses somebody else and the cycle repeats. The dragon's return is the true ending for a reason because it breaks the cycle. Breaking destructive cycles and ascending is literally the entire point of Buddhism, which is featured front and center all throughout Sekido. Wolf effectively walks the eightfold path to right the wrongs around him. He achieves full self-actualization and he uses this to create harmony from discord and through the dragon's return ending achieves a result no one else could have allowing this cycle to finally be broken. The game even reinforces this mechanically as this is easily the most complicated ending to achieve and you need to jump through a lot of hoops and walk down some really, really weird paths. Only Wolf could have done this in tandem with the Divine Child. What's ultra important about this, of course, is also how you handle this with the Divine Child. She explicitly goes out of her way to not say whether this is right or wrong, but it is up to you. What do you want, Wolf? What do you think is best for all parties involved? Sanctum. Shinobi of the Divine Heir. Yes? This path differs from that of the one to sever immortality. I do not wish to force my opinion upon you. Should you wish to return the dragon's heritage, then perhaps you should seek out the High Senpo Priest. I'll think about it. She gives him a real choice with no strings attached. Wolf chooses to ignite his own divine spark in this ending, and in so doing does not save Ashina. Ashina is just an idea and is well beyond saving at this point, but he saves the people of these lands from eternal damnation. Stuck in a hellish wheel of pain and misery, the dragon is returned to its rightful place and the world moves closer to harmony. The story of Sekido is about a broken child born into a broken world. The broken child is raised by his world to become a broken man. But that broken man learns to think and choose through his adventure. He uses the divine tools of reasoning to see what is wrong with his world, the imbalances that surround him, and chooses to become more than the world would ever allow him to be naturally. Through trial and tribulation, he finds truth and purpose, allowing him to shed his unfortunate past of extreme trauma and become the Buddhist ideal. He finds the truth, he breaks the cycle, and heals both his world and himself. Sekido is fundamentally about the path to enlightenment, told in a way that you can feel because you vicariously lived through it. I think this quote from Isaac from Netflix's Castlevania, I think it sums up the feeling quite nicely. I have recently begun to consider the future, which has been a novelty for me because I never really thought I had one. This is how they get us, Hector. They convince us that there is no future. There's only an eternal now. And the best we can do is survive until dawn and then do it all again. That's no way to live. 
And I've discovered to some surprise that I am interested in living. I am interested in building a way to live. And I think I will start here. I'm going to live. This video is a bit of a departure from my regular content, but honestly, I'd love to make more of it. I love exploring stories and the philosophical ramifications thereof. I don't like begging for subs, likes, and comments, but here we are. A video like this is a Herculean undertaking since I'm doing all of it myself, so I would love it if it was spread around and I was monetarily compensated for it because then I can make more of them. Sekido has a wonderfully, wonderfully complicated story with just a beautiful lesson buried underneath it that I don't think a lot of people got to. But it's not, surprise, surprise, the only FromSoft title like this. They're kind of all like this with layers upon layers buried underneath them. And I love the chance to explore them. There's also more. I would have fit in here if I had time, a more thorough exploration of Emma's impact on the story as a mirror to Wolf or the fact that Owl's offer to Child Wolf is a true Faustian bargain power in exchange for his very soul. Also that both the child and Kuro seem to be allegories for the Buddha in this story and other things of that nature, but I have finite time with which to do this and I don't want the video to go on forever. Also, I don't think it's an accident that our main protagonist's name is Wolf, as it relates really well to that old story and meme of, you have two wolves inside of you. What are those wolves doing in there? They shouldn't be in there, get them out. One is white and one is black. Sound familiar? The story implies that the black wolf is evil and shouldn't be fed. After all, the wolf you feed is the wolf that grows. But that black wolf is also part of you, and you need to feed both to remain in balance. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you learned something, if not about the game, about yourself. Peace out, guys. Stay safe out there. Also, thank you, channel members. I appreciate the patronage.